Well, good morning, folks. It is, well, what, the first week of November? Well, at least the first full week of November, anyway. Uh, I'm your host, Dave Thompson. I am the director of the Academy of Cleaning Excellence here in Orlando, Florida, and the host of your show today, Beyond Clean with Ace. As you can see, I have a guest with me today. We're doing a video podcast. So if you're listening, you can't watch the video. You can't see Richard. But if you are watching the video podcast, Welcome, Richard. Thanks, David. Excited to be here. Really appreciate that. Excited to talk about best practices and any ways to help the industry. Well, uh, this is Richard Prinz. He is the Global Vice President of Sales and Marketing, EvaClean Infection Prevention Solutions. I think I've got that right. So uh, I'll let you tell the listeners you know, a little bit about you, the company, and uh, kind of an introduction there. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, my name is Rich Prins. I'm a global VP of sales and marketing. You absolutely got that correct. I've got about 20 years experience in multiple industries, including hospitality, manufacturing, and significant amount of healthcare. Done uh, uh, full perioperative ass assessments in the past. So, the really the uh, wide variety of industries I've been in have helped be able to look at what everyone does in terms of that need for cleaning and disinfecting. So it gave me a, a great amount of experience to be able to look into some of the things that I'm currently doing right now. And that's where we're providing a proactive approach to infection prevention using safer chemistries and advanced technologies. You know, you know, Richard, it's it's interesting as you say that. Um, you know, I, I think about a gentleman that once told me that he didn't really think I had twenty years of experience, and, and as you said, that I couldn't help but uh, remember that. And his version of that was, "You have twenty years of doing the one year of experience." And so I think whenever you mentioned all the different disciplines, that is progressive experience, and this is what's interesting about our profession. You know, many people think that in the cleaning industry, you only do one thing, but man, we cover everything. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm, I'm really glad that you said that. I was actually in a hospital operating room on Friday doing some training and really a lot that I've done in the past, I was able to correlate and have conversations with the uh, director of nursing and the OR director and really being able to relate. So that valuable experience in uh, many different industries help translate to best practices and protocols. Yeah, uh, whenever really you've yeah, whenever you've done like what we have, and we've in, in infection prevention, uh, you know, audience, I got to tell you, we do this in every building on the planet. It's not you know, some many some people think it's just healthcare or or some. We, it's every building on the planet. It is it, every everyone, and it's it's when we're I'm, I'm out at uh, dinner events and any personal events, just having conversations and knowing that uh, from restaurant industry to manufacturing, industrial, education, all have that need, and uh, we start talking through what the typical protocols are and realizing, and I know we we spoke about this in the past, but that. Uh, Throughout the pandemic, it's really eye-opening because the more you talk to people, the more you find out that in the last year and a half to two years, there were so many people out there just combing the shelves of a hardware store that said anything that said cleaner and disinfectant, and now really encouraging everyone to look at SDS sheets and realize that it's important to make sure something's effective and safer for them, their customers, their family. Uh, even their pets. <laughs> yeah, just because it's on the store shelf doesn't mean it's safe. Absolutely, that's and and, 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 and as you and as you say that they were going to the hardware store, as you said, and buying paint sprayers. You know that you apply paint on on houses with to put disinfectant out, and it's like, uh, I mean, you know, I champion the fact that people wanted to do something, but this this plane had to stop. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we looked in uh, uh, one firehouse that was using a pump sprayer with uh, pesticide and different things like that because that's what they felt that they had to use. And we were able to convert them to utilizing our electrostatic technology 
and uh, of course our pure tabs, the uh, uh, our tablets that actually have that zero 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 HMIS rating or hazardous material identification system. Yeah, I, I thank you for explaining that because we use so many acronyms in our industry. Uh, and it was interesting whenever I was translating some of our courses here at the academy over to Spanish. Um, there's a lot of words that we use in our industry that isn't translatable. Yeah. And so when you when you say HMIS, a lot of people don't know what that means. Yeah, absolutely. We always reference the diamond. If you're looking at an SDS sheet, you look at the diamond and you're hoping to see it's like a golf score. The lowest number is, is very important, zero, zero, zero. Yeah, and that, you know, my color back here, the blue color, the blue diamond, that's the health rating, folks. That's the one you want to look for. Uh, you know, as you say this, I, I think of uh, a new course that we're having for our infection prevention here at the end of this month uh, for 2022. And, you know, it's recertifying people that have already taken the course and giving them advanced knowledge for, you know, for the upcoming year, because things do change. And I thought, you know what, we need to really talk about the chemicals that the people use. And I always tell them in class, just go home and take a look at the rings that the chemicals leave on the wood under your sink. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> that is a really good point. Yeah. Those, uh, and I live, uh, in an area where there's uh, a lot of, uh, um, we, we don't have the best water in my town. So uh, I see rings uh, from not only chemicals, but also from just water uh, left on like, yeah, just in the sink itself and our system, because it's a clean, safer solution, it actually takes care and eliminates those uh, uh, as well, which for our wipe system, which is fantastic. Well, I think this is the thing is, is that there's many products that we can use chemistry wise that now, instead of leaving a residue in the tanks of the equipment, actually clean the tanks of the equipment. So, um, you know, my point to people is if it cleans the tanks out, what do you think it's doing to the surface that you're using it on? So it's a great point. I mean, I think that now I really like having these conversations because it's just eye-opening and it really helps educate people across the board because uh, um, we, not many, and I know you've been in the industry and I've looked at uh, everything from your Rockstar Custodian uh, certification, which is fantastic by the Thank way. You. And, Thank uh, you. but you've seen the industry, just the cleaning industry itself. And you brought up a good point. It's, it's every industry, but the cleaning section of, of every industry has evolved tremendously. And now you have everyone looking at things a little bit differently, which is important because, but at the same time, it'd be remiss not to say that you and I still go into restaurants and we see someone spraying and wiping right away. And you know what that that's not uh, following the, uh, um, the master label. It's not following the SDS sheets and, and the uh, protocols. Uh, we, that's why there's so many more convenient, but at the same time, effective and safer options out there. Well, you know, Daryl Hicks, that comes on the show quite regularly, an infection prevention expert uh, in the industry. You know, he talks about this all the time, exactly that. His thing is, is whenever the pandemic started, you know, the, the grocery store clerk was out there taking a spray bottle, spraying the hand handrail wiping it and then going to the next one using the same rag to just wipe the next one and the next one. He said you could have wiped 20 or 30 carts with the same dirty rag. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, one of my students brought this up. He said, you know, we've got millions now of infection prevention experts. They watch Dr. Fauci on TV and they're an expert now. <laughs> do, do, you, do you find you're still yeah, fighting that's, this? <laughs> that's what it takes. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that? David? I, I was laughing at your joke. <laughs> that's that's okay. Well, it wasn't a joke. It was, I mean, you know, the, the student was absolutely serious. And I thought about it. And I thought at first, I'm like you, I kind of took it as a funny joke. But then I think about it. and I think, you know what, people that I communicate with and live with outside of our profession, this is what they think. And they got so many different varied uh, uh, pathways last year from both the you know, our TV and, and the CDC. And it's a struggle sometimes for us to help them navigate it professionally. 
Yeah, I think that's a it's a really good point because there's always the um, it's the same with the my way or your way or anything like that. But the, the reason why we really like what we do on a daily basis and my team takes pride in it, we do we look at the facts, look at SDS sheets and we do a true comparison of everything out there. We have nothing against any of the products itself, but we look at different types of what's safer for you and what's uh, what's the overall more effective and everything from factor everything from I mentioned the HMIS, but also pH, if it's neutral pH. And because uh, if it's obviously more acidic, be more corrosive to the surfaces, especially stainless steel. But then we also look at dwell time. I mean, are you going to be in a position to um, factor in the climate if the uh, chemical you're using has a 10 minute dwell time? Um, or if you're using something that uh, the Joint Commission or CDC recommends in that four minutes or, or five, I guess five minutes or less, um, really being able to stay wet during that time. And that's why having a good one-two punch of cleaning and disinfecting is imperative. And you mentioned or touched on the electrostatic technology or the fact that uh, uh, there is something out there in addition to or I guess you reference the paint sprayers versus what we have is true electrostatic technology. And that mitigates any cross contamination. So you're really, there, there's being able to look, if you're utilizing this technology, look to something that was truly uh, made to be an electrostatic sprayer. There's a few of them out there. You know, Dr. Greg down in Australia, that's on our show quite often, you know, brought up a point when we were talking through this uh, application device uh, scenario, and he was talking about biofilms that are left in the bottles, you know, from trigger sprayers and other devices. Uh, and, and he brought up a good point that, you know, if the container isn't rinsed after every use before it's refilled, it builds up a biofilm in the bottle. Now you're spraying a biofilm out of it when it was supposed to be what was doing the work for you. Um, do you do you have issues with this kind of thing? I mean, we're, we're talking about edu educating people in a different way than they've ever been educated before. Yeah, so uh, in a way, um, yeah, have we had conversations and train the trainers and follow up in terms of where the uh, protocols weren't being followed to a T, absolutely. I mean, it just, it, it's unfortunate, but that does happen. And that's why we really encourage these, these trainings, whether it's the first time, right, when purchasing or a follow-up several months or a year later, we are always happy to schedule those because we want, well, it's a simplified approach following 30 seconds of maintenance at the end of each day goes a long way to, to make sure, yeah, rinsing is, is part of it. If, if uh, you're factoring in the uh, electrostatic technology as well, spraying out all the fluid at the end, not letting any solution remain in the sprayer. There's a, and then with tablets, because there's a sustainable edge there, uh, sustainable differentiator, yeah, but you still have to make sure that tablet fully dissolves. One, for the right efficacy, but also to make sure that you're not going to, you're going to mitigate any clogging and uh, really maintain the life of that sprayer. Yeah, and I think that's a good point there too, Richard, is that, you know, we have to make sure that we take care of the application devices. You know, I, I hear this all the time, my whole career, well, this piece, this, you know, and then they call it a piece of junk. Well, you know, when you really look at it, uh, they're not using it properly, as you said, in the training part, the skills training, they don't know why they're using it, which is even more important. And then the thing that they do, don't do is they don't do maintenance, you know, um, they just up and leave when they're done, and then the next person has to deal with it. And and this is a thing that devices, especially mechanical devices like what you're talking about, create an issue in our industry when you get un, uneducated, unskilled labor like we've had in this last year, then trying to help the people that are actually certified to do the job. Yeah, it, one thing that you said that really resonates is that uh, those don't know why they're using that technology. And it it's very evident. I was at a, uh, my team and I we were at a 
um, a building uh, show or conference a few weeks ago here in Boston. And many team members say, or many customers came up, said, oh, we use that. We use that exact one and didn't know really. We, we showed them the uh, spraying with my cell phone. You spray the front with the electric stacks <laughs> off. You spray it and you just get the front. You spray it with electric stacks on. You get the front and back. But really talking about standing two, two feet away and the one second flyover and everyone was like, oh, we don't do that. So being able to really make sure you're letting the electrostatic technology do the work. And that's, uh, I always relate to uh, when I was growing up and I'd spray with a trigger spray bottle, glass cleaner as much as possible and as much paper towels as possible. I, I just, I remember having garbage bags full of paper towels if I was cleaning the, uh, put in the uh, uh, glass for my, my parents as, as like any type of chores that I had to do. But really it's less is more with this technology in the right system. It's really that one second flyover, you're gonna have that right amount of even coverage. Well, and, and folks, as you're watching or listening today, wanna to explain, I, I have to do this, Richard. It's just part of what I do here. Uh, there is a proper way to apply these chemis this chemistry. And by the way, we're not talking about just disinfectant. I appreciate what you said. Clean and disinfect. Two different chemicals or could be the same chemical two steps. But physical removal using whatever it is first. And, you know, the thing is, when you apply it on there, folks, you don't apply it from the top and let it run down. And you were talking about over application. And this is what we got a lot of and probably still do because they're over applying the chemistry. But even that, no matter what, you always apply from the bottom up and clean from the top down. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what you said, Richard. You know, as much as we'll train people, as much as we give them all the knowledge, we go back to our old habits. And so whenever we get back to that application, we just kind of, and this is what you see in videos and stuff. And this is what you and I fight all the time is try to do it in a proper method from the bottom up. And that way you don't get the runs on the, if you're getting runs with an electrostatic sprayer, you're over applied, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And we do that demonstration, did one in the hospital a couple of weeks ago where he showed every team member. And then I went and got within maybe, six to eight inches and I sprayed and then you'd see it run down. I said, you never want to see that. <laughs> uh, and then obviously being able to spray it on a, a table in a wheelchair to be able to do the top, uh, uh, top and bottom in like a conference room. I always explain to where we can do conference room and basically a 10th the other amount of time go in, you're spraying. It's a non-touch mitigating cross-contamination but you also brought up a really good point that cleaning first, cleaning visible or invisible soil, and uh, then utilizing the electrostatic technology within EPA approved and hopefully zero, zero, zero uh, disinfectant, then you'll be able to uh, really have that full effectiveness and make sure that you have a, a safer approach. Okay, so you, you mentioned something that's uh, you know really dear to my heart here, the invisible soil. Please explain for our audience today what we're talking about here, Richard. Yeah, so um, really when it comes to soil, I mean, the, the obvious is something that you can see. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go into a little bit of, in the past, we used to uh, see a lot of people were cleaning for, I mean, there, there's two reasons to clean in my, my viewpoint. It's for appearance or for health. And Appearance is really that visible soil, anything that you can see or and really picking up the papers, different things like that. And I think from just an overall business setting, appearance is important, but health is even more important. And that's where the invisible soil, because you're removes, removing visible and invisible soil, debris, microorganisms. I mean, you, you can't necessarily see microorganisms because, I mean, they're called microorganisms for a reason, right? Yeah, that, yeah that, because they're too small for my eye. I can't, and, and, exactly. and my point is, is the, the microbes that we're after, I can't see. So the food that they live on, I can't see. So to say remove visible soil, okay. 
And this, I think, where a lot of these people over the last uh, 24 months, especially, they missed that fact. They thought that the only thing they had to do was spray disinfectant and wipe it off. And that's where a lot of people went wrong. Correct. That's what we're seeing, too. And that's why uh, your training guides are phenomenal to be able to really make sure that everyone is mindful. And I guess not only mindful, but being now being more proactive than in the past reactive. And we take the same approach. That's why I really glad to be on this show to be able to talk and relate to some of the great things that you and your team do, as well as like, likewise that we're trying to promote from that proactive approach. So folks, uh, we're talking today with Richard Prince. He is with uh, EvaClean. Uh, we are sponsored by Gym Supply here in Central Florida. We appreciate their sponsorship to give us the time and the ability to do this podcast for you. We try to make sure that everything we talk about is healthy, positive, and proactive. I think you've already heard most of those words already. Uh, Richard, whenever you look at all of this, uh, I get into some discussions some, with some people, and I know you mentioned the HMIS being triple zero, but not everybody uses that chemistry. And, and I agree, we would like for them to, but some cases that's not available. How do you feel about rinsing chemistry after it's been applied to a surface? So from a, um, from a cleaner perspective, I, I always recommend following the, uh, uh, following the, the protocols and following the IFUs. If you have a, uh, I think rinsing in certain cases is really important. I mean, if, if you factor in, let's say our pure tabs, which we have, we're NSF, National San Sanitizing Foundation, certified for a non-rinse, especially when it comes to that food contact with that sanitizing or 100 parts per million. So uh, making sure that you're utilizing the IFU is extremely important. There are certain cleaners in uh, that are needing for rinse. I know your viewpoint on it to where I think in the past you've talked about the, the car wash, you take it through and then you rinse it through. I think it's important because there's so many different uh, types of uh, chemistries and also types of uh, uh, technologies out there. So you're utilizing that IFU. But then again, Richard, this means that people have to read the label. You're asking them <laughs> to do something they don't do. <laughs> Well, or have a conversation. We're always happy to do. That's why we really enjoy training. We enjoy saying, this is what you need to do. We've got our, uh, we've got our pure one, which is our cleaner and disinfectant. We have our disposable wipe program with, uh, with pure one. So you can actually wipe it in the hospital setting and then let it remain wet for that four minutes. And it's going to, it's going to dry on the surface there. That's where right. you're utilizing our pure one is actually that first chemistry that has that biofilm kill claim. So really important. You'd mentioned biofilm, but the fact that biofilm lives not only in healthcare, you see it in restaurants and in different uh, industries as well. And the CDC estimates that 65% uh, of healthcare associated infections are caused by biofilm. You mentioned wipes. Mm -hmm. And I get this question I won't say repeatedly, but quite often. How long should I use a wipe before I grab another one? How many surfaces can I do? Uh, there, there seems to be this um, feeling out there, and I won't particularly say whom, that you can just use it until it's visibly soiled. Oh, okay. You want to make sure that you have that. That's where training comes into play because you do not want to make sure that you wipe it until it's visibly soiled. You want to make sure if you take our disposable wipe, you'll see the, you, you, you'll see the visible wetness. And that's what you need to do. You need to see the visible wetness and you're going to wipe it like this. It, it's funny because I do two trainings. One that is a fan of the karate kid when it comes to the electrostatic technology. I say when you're in an open hallway, you can do the paint the fence. Um, but when you do, when you're doing our white program, you cannot do the wax on wax off. You can do side to side and you want to make sure that you're going to see that, uh, wetness and then you grab the next one. So we do a actual very in-depth training when it comes to especially healthcare and higher ed 
the reason why we chose those specific industries for a pure excellence program is because they have environmental services teams and we want to make sure everyone is trained the approximate number of how many wipes per room and we do a full training to be able to cover that so it really uh reference what you said and not just okay but if you do um see if you have come across visible soil like uh especially when it comes to healthcare and certain uh which are specific to healthcare you're going to want to grab another wipe so if you start with an area where it's uh very much contaminated, you're not going to want to keep going, uh, even if you see that uh, visible uh, wetness. Well, I think it was interesting you said how many wipes per room. Um, now here, uh, about 14 months ago, I was in uh, several different hospitals with heart surgery. And you know, even from my situation and condition, I couldn't turn off what I could see. And you know, I, I actually told them, don't come into my room. I was there for 10 days. I said, don't come into my room and do it any service. Because what I had observed was that you just came in with one wipe and, and wiped everything in the whole room with one wipe. And I'm like, don't even come in here. I, I you, know, you know, and the thing is, I tell people, I can't, kill, I can't catch an illness from my own stuff. You know, this is my phone, Richard. You know, keep your hands off of my phone. Yeah, that was a great line. I know you said it to me in our last conversation. Yeah, you, you can't get uh, uh, you can't get uh, sick from your own germs, right? Is that the exact uh, exact line? Yes, my, my phone is my phone. I do a lot of, and I spray this phone a lot with with our system because uh, I like a uh, a clean um, like a clean phone or as clean as it could be. We, we know what. Uh, Contaminants can be uh, on on these phones, phones, keyboards, water fountains. I mean, very there's daily uh, things that you see or use on a daily basis or used to use um, are very much contaminated with bacteria and microorganisms. Yeah, and, and and so you know that goes back to you know what we both uh, really champion a lot is education and then skills training after that. Uh, devices and chemistry are important to what we do. They're a necessity. Um, but I always have. I've, I've always laid that there's more importance to knowing why I'm doing it so that I use those tools and, and devices correctly. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, really knowing why you're using the technology, the safer solution, what, uh, um, what the proper dwell times is, are and as well as the pathogens that you're looking to. I mean, we mentioned healthcare, but it's important to that know that uh, both of us actually have protocols and training in every industry that we speak with, and we customize that because we know that uh, in uh, that let, let's say the health and fitness has a little bit uh, different in terms of versus the cruise industries and and norovirus and. While COVID-19 is, it, it's everywhere, as we know, but there are also specific uh, pathogens that you find more so in, let's say, healthcare like Candidorus or C. diff, and really making sure you have a sporicidal and a proactive approach. Well, yeah, and you mentioned you have to have different levels of um, disinfectants depending on the environments that you're in. Daryl Hicks calls it fit purpose. What's the purpose of the environment that you're working in? And is the protocol fit for the purpose that that area is being used for? And I think as, as you talked about um, healthcare, when, whenever you talk about healthcare, Richard, give the audience a little bit of a perception of, of what, what do you consider a healthcare setting? Yeah, that's a really great uh, great point so when we say healthcare in general we're referring to the acute hospital setting but also uh, non-acute which can either be um, surgery centers and clinics and uh, rehab hospitals and things of that sort but then also um, you're going to be looking at like long-term care like senior living so we while healthcare is such a broad term so I'm glad that you mentioned that, we obviously have segments, whether it's a hospital, 
it's a little bit different in terms of that if it's a senior living long-term care, but there's a lot of overlap as you'd expect. But, but you did, even in those environments, uh, even in a hospital, like you said, acute, we have different areas of that hospital that are fit for a different purpose. Um, do we use the same chemistry and protocols everywhere? So you can. That's a great, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the most part, you can. So we use the same system in the OR as we do the patient rooms because it's a safer approach. Uh, we're also... Uh, we look at uh, and we factor in everything, whether it's a class one medical device, and we make sure that we work with the manufacturer to get on all the different IFUs um, to be able to do all this, this testing. But from an overall perspective, the same chemistry can be used in the waiting areas as it can in uh, the OR and the uh, hospital and the patient rooms, I should say, because it's a safer, uh, safer solution, but there's also different uh, concentrations. So we factor in what we're using for the floors is that same level. And that's why we call it a standardized approach with our Pure One, but we're using that sporicidal and to make sure that you're going to be killing C. diff and Candidorus and or taking care of these pathogens. I know kill is a little uh, rough term there, but it's, it's true. And making sure that you're it, simplifying the process, but being more effective. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, but I, li I like what you just said, Richard, is, is there's people that just think we just kill germs. And you mentioned specific types of, of if you will, germs, which are pathogenic organisms. Uh, you know, whenever people come to class, I give them a whole vocabulary that they never knew before they came. And they're like, Wow. I said, you know, this is the thing about our industry. We need to talk in a different language than what we've been talking if you want the value that really befits the job. Yep, absolutely. And I think one of the things that you pointed out, you have to, I think in the past, everyone looked at, oh, I need to have a bathroom cleaner for the bathroom. I need to have a toilet cleaner for the toilet, floor cleaner for the floor. And the fact that we have a proactive approach with a standardized approach. And when you think about having more or more different products, it's not always the best way to do things. And one thing to point out, and we mentioned hospitals, so point out a specific hospital that we started working with, that was using 14 different chemicals for cleaning and disinfecting in, in multiple areas. And it's just not feasible for any everyone, or at least I wouldn't be able to re remember every single protocol, every dwell time, every uh, PP needed for all 14 different products. And that's why we say replace these with this. And you have one proactive approach with Pure One using it on the floors, the high touch areas, the windows, mirrors, bathrooms, and it's one simplified process, but we're able to train uh, and making sure that everyone becomes the expert in one product besides versus knowing a little bit of 14. Yeah, and enough to make all of us dangerous and all of those. You know, what's interesting is over my 50-year career, you know, I've seen it go from a very few products to multitudes of products to where we're now coming full circle back to standardizing and minimizing those. You know, there was a time where 55-gallon drums was the standard. Do you ever see a 55-gallon drum sitting in a, in, a, in a supply closet anymore? Not very. So in healthcare or in manufacturing industrial, absolutely. But in healthcare, absolutely not. But you see a lot of the, uh, uh, you, you'll see a lot of the one-gallon um, uh, liquid disinfectant in those closets. And we do a great before-after of that versus our tablets is, and, but the 55 gallon drum, I mean, if you factor in that, there's not, it takes up a lot of space and it's very, it, it adds a, a, an extra step. Well, and I think this goes to the, the use of chemistry properly because all of these concentrates have dilution rates. And, you know, if we don't dilute them correctly, all of what you and I've talked about so far is, well, worthless. Yeah, and that's the thing, being able to just, like you said, follow instructions, but at the same time, 
if they're simplified, they're easier to follow. That's just my opinion across the board. You got to keep things simple, but uh, make sure it's effective. So I'm going to make an assumption. This is why you like the tablets. Yes, absolutely. I mean, 32 ounces, you drop a tablet in and uh, you let it dissolve. I did a, a training with the hospital on Friday. We went into the four different set. We did one, walked in the next room, did another, did another, did another. Came back to the first one. It was fully dissolved, made the wipes. Everything was was ready to go. And uh, we had a, a fun conversation with the uh, uh, the team in the OR. So it was, it was great to be able to show why we decided to use this system. And it's because... So- well, go ahead. The only thing that you've got to worry about then is really the, uh, making sure the tablet dissolves. Absolutely. You, you definitely have to make sure the tablet dissolves. That's your, that's your mixing and dilution right there. Huh? Yeah, but it mitigates human error. If you drop in the tablet, you're not, you're not doing the... I, you referenced the car wash. I, I referenced the car wash when it comes to liquid concentrate because if it tells me to put a, uh, a half an ounce versus a gallon of water... I'm putting like five or six ounces at least of that uh, of that car wash solution. That's how I've always done it. But now uh, it mitigates the tablet mitigates error for a guy like me to be able to, or a person like me to be able to um, add in whatever they want. It really you know, mitigates that error. You know, Richard, I've never seen a custodian ever put back the concentrate that he overused. Oh yeah, never. <laughs> and, and, and I'm pointing the finger back at me. <laughs> yep. I did yeah, the same I, thing. I, right. I mean, you know, you're, if you pour it out of the gallon jug, I'm not going to, you know, try to pour it back in. It's already in the water, you know? So what, the, you know, and I, and I think this is, you know, whenever I go to places and you mix, you mentioned the gallon jugs, if there's not a dilute control unit on the wall and there's not a measuring cup in the closet, it's not being used properly and they're not getting the kill factors. I don't care how they're using it. Absolutely. And I mean, when you factor the dilution control, I mean, if the proper maintenance of that is not uh, being factored in, or if it's the four different utilizing the wrong one, there's still risks there. And well, you, you had to go, you had to go to maintenance on it. Didn't you? You just had to go there. <laughs> That's probably the third or fourth time I've said maintenance today, this morning. So. <laughs> well, but, but this is, Richard, we're in the maintenance industry. This is what we do. But yet when it comes to all of the equipment, we don't maintain. And this is where we catch problems or issues in the whole scenario. And I think this is the conversation that you and I are having this morning. Uh, and I champion the fact that we're having these conversations. You know, the, we're in our fifth year of this podcast. And I have struggled to get people like yourself or anybody to come on the air and talk. It's been like, but in the last year and a half, it's like, okay, I got three podcasts today to do. And that's a wonderful thing because now people are wanting to talk about all of this stuff. And I think more people are becoming educated in the proper way because of folks like you and I. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And it becomes this and it, carries over into the everyday life, not just in, in this type of set, setting. I know when you're out and about, you have conversations on a daily basis, more so than you probably ever did. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because it, it, it's now, I won't say as much front of mind, top of mind as it has been over the last year, but it's still there. Um, you can just simply, I'm, you know, well, you know, of course, right now it's, are you vaccinated? You know, uh, do you have a mask? And then it becomes now the, the, the disinfection and cleaning, where before it was the cleaning and disinfection, the mask, and then we were waiting for the vaccination. It's flipped a little bit, but it's all, all three are still there. And I always tell people, you know, the vaccine is not 100%. The mask is not 100%. Cleaning and disinfection is not 100%. These are all protocols to help us mitigate. And you've used that word several times too. Absolutely. And really, if you factor in a combination of the protocols to yeah, mitigate the risk, because that's what we're doing. The, the risk of, of illness, the risk of spreading 
And, uh, and, and I know we've talked about COVID-19, but then we referenced earlier that there's so many other different types of risks for other pathogens and illness out there on a daily basis. I mean, we think last year, the, the flu virus, which every year the, the numbers of the flu are astronomical. And last year with all these measures taking place to uh, be focused on COVID-19, the flu season was virtually non-existent. It's obviously um, been, uh, I guess, everyone's saying it's going to be back in full force, which uh, we're starting to see now. But um, that's one of the things that if you really have the right measures in place, you can pre prevent any type of other uh, pathogens in illness. Well, Daryl Hicks is going to be on this afternoon with his podcast. You know, his thing that he's talking about in our new course is twin dim twin dimic COVID and flu. And I think uh, we're going to get some better numbers this year as relative to what the actual issues really are. Um, last year, I think all of our numbers were a little bit skewed. And I think we'll get better numbers. But um, unfortunately, I think we're seeing people that are worried about getting COVID vaccination and aren't getting flu vaccination. And then they're thinking that because they're vaccinated, they can back off of the protocols of cleaning and disinfection. And I think this is what Daryl is mentioning, and maybe you are as well, that this is what we're going to be fighting through May of next year. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely alluding to that uh, same thing. And I'll, I'll tune in to Daryl's. I'm very intrigued to listen to that as well. So it's a, it's a great topic because we always do that. We focus on, uh, on that one, one type of thing and, and not realize there's a lot of other things going on. And I was speaking with a uh, um, very high level, one of the uh, major school districts. And when I referenced norovirus, she talked about what was occurring uh, in 2019, that they had a huge outbreak of uh, norovirus. And the fact that uh, uh, we have a, a program that obviously uh, has a claim against norovirus is extremely important because uh, that's a, it's one of those pathogens. It's one of those things to where within it's you're contagious before you get any symptoms. And it's uh, very much spreads like wildfire. Well, and, and the thing is, is I don't think a lot of the general public knew the differences between bacteria and viruses, how long they can live on the surface, the size of a virus. These are all things that we talk about in our infection prevention course so that the professionals that get the certificates from us are well informed. <clears throat> you know, I always tell people my certificate that we give you after you have passed your exam is not proof of performance. It's proof of concept. Uh, there still has to be performance. And so we hope that people that get the certificates do follow the protocols that we've outlined. You know, there's not a protocol for everybody. It's mm -hmm. a great point. It, it's, and we, we've talked about this earlier, the, the customized approach. It's different. Different industries have different needs. And uh, while it's a, you can utilize that same chemistry. You just have to use it for the right application and the right uh, using the right protocols. And that's where you and I come into play. And, and then really everyone comes into play because you have to be able to follow it and develop that cadence. So at EverClean, you guys only work with one device, one product. So we have, um, it's really our system itself, which is, that two-step, step one, step two. I always, we always say it's a simplified approach. Can't really get much more simple, simple than step one and step two. You want to be that full, full effective, uh, uh, to have a full effective system. But pure one is our step one. That's our hospital grade cleaner and disinfectant. I say hospital grade, but it, as we mentioned, can use it in every single industry from hospitality to education and transportation and beyond. And that's what really replaces those up to 14 different chemicals that I mentioned before. You're using it more in that traditional method of whether a trigger spray bottle, disposable wipes uh, with flat mops, 
et cetera, et cetera. But you're also then knowing that traditional methods are typically going to get you up to 25 to 30% of that surface coverage. Our step two is our Protexas electrostatic sprayer and our pure tabs to get the up to 70 to 75% of the remaining surface coverage in half the time. Everyone, I'm, I'm sure that as you're listening to this, there's a lot of holes that we've left here. And I'm sure that you haven't got a complete view of everything that we talk about, uh, both in the EvaClean program and here at the Academy. So we encourage you to engage either one of us, both of us maybe, and, and see the similarities. But also what we're saying is gain a certification. Infection prevention is mitigating issues for health. I mean, we, we really only do one job for one reason, clean for health. But parents will follow if we take care of something healthy. Um, Richard, is there any last words that we would like to cover before we close here today? No, I think you hit the nail on the head with saying cleaning for health is extremely important. And uh, I'm always available uh, to reach out to. Reach out. You can find me at evaclean.com. I really, really appreciate being part of this show and uh, happy to continue the conversation. So, folks, we will have this on our podcast, which is Beyond Clean with Ace, all one word. It is uh, produced out there on Podbean. We'll also have the video version that you're watching uh, here on our YouTube channel. And, yes, we're like everybody else, www.academyofcleaning.com. You have the Rockstar program that you mentioned, Richard. Thank you very much. And you will also find that we're on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, in Twitter, Instagram, and I forget all the rest of them, but you know where they're at. So go and share those, go and like us, uh, do the same for Richard and Everclean. Please, whatever you do, make sure that whatever you do from now until the next time that we're on the air with you, make sure it's healthy, positive, and proactive. Richard, I've got one last question for you. What's sure. on your personal bucket list that you want to achieve? My personal bucket list is uh, to travel more, travel more with my family, with my, my wife and, and two wonderful daughters. Uh, we've, we've been to Europe several times as a family, and we'd like to uh, eventually go to uh, Australia as a family at one point in time. We've got some friends who recently moved out there, and we'd like to eventually move and visit them out in Australia. Okay, so you almost said move to Australia, didn't you? <laughs> Not yet, anyway, right? I, I heard visit, that. I heard visit. that. I, I was about to, ready to ask you if you told the wife and kids you were moving to Australia. <laughs> yep, not not at this point in time, but uh, definitely want to visit first. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have to get you hooked up with Dr. Greg Whiteley. He is uh, he comes on the podcast quite often. He's a, a chemistry guy down there, runs a, a, a big program. Uh, maybe just go back and look at our podcast, Dr. Greg Whiteley. Uh, he's Australian. So uh, maybe give you a good point. I'm, I'm sure that he can actually show you around the, the country down there. That, that would be great. That would be amazing. And y'all can talk shop a little bit too. And I'm going to throw back on you. What's on your personal bucket list, David? Now you know what? I, as many times as I've asked that question, nobody's ever done that. I've been waiting for somebody to actually do it. I'm not going to say, I mean, you know, it's just, but, but you're, Hey, that one's a good one. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have one that's immediate, uh, really, right now. I, I've never been able to get into a hot air balloon. And actually, last year, I had it planned, but I just couldn't see going up there, spending my money and the time, and be re regulated to have to wear a mask in the balloon uh, up there. So, I, I, folks, I haven't done it simply because you know what? I want to wait until I can go up there and enjoy it without having to breathe through a mask. I have COPD and it's difficult to, at best uh, mm -hmm. to do that through there. Traveling on a plane for a long period of time is just really a problem, but uh, that's on my immediate bucket list. Um, my long-term one is just do what I keep doing. I moved to Florida. I de-stressed. Uh, I live in an RV park. I'm in Florida. I mean, and I love the job I do, so I don't know what else, you know, what I can do. I'm like you. Almost everybody I ask that want to travel. Yeah. No, that's great. It's a, it's a great point. And uh, 
glad to glad to hear your love and what you do, and that's that's extremely important. I will end with the I did not know you needed to have a mask on a hot air balloon because maybe it's because I have no desire to be way up there, but uh, uh, I did not know that. So you learn something every day. <laughs> well, and that's what I didn't. I you know it was the furthest thing from my mind when I set it up. I was about ready to pay, but I thought you know I'll call these folks and everything. They said, yeah, we're we're you know, we're in the aviation and just like in an airplane, you have to have one. So if you're in the gondola, you have to wear one. And I said, if there's only four of us and I know everybody except for you, he said, we still have to do it. And I appreciate that. I didn't argue with them. I mean, that's the rules. It's the regulations, uh, my choice to go or not. And I'm just waiting. So uh, folks, I got to tell you, whenever I can go without a mask covering my nose and mouth, I'm going to go in a hot air balloon. I'm in Florida. I want to go see it up there. Uh, I watch them all the time, you know, in the early mornings. And it's like, I just ain't got there yet, but I will, I will. Just like, I'm sure you're going to take the wife and family to Australia too. Yes. And, uh, uh, but yes, been on a lot of planes recently with, with the mask and getting used to it. I have another one next week. So, uh, uh, that I'm getting used to wearing the mask for longer through periods of time, but uh, yeah, I've got, I've got a conf- I've got a conference this week. I got to go to, and that was, that's the rule. You have to wear one inside mm-hmm. the conference center the whole time. And, and, uh, I will endure it as long as I possibly can, but it, it's, it's the part of life that we do. And, and you and I understand these things. We understand the protocols as we've talked today. Uh, we don't fight those. Um, but I, I do hope at some point we can lose the mandates for masks and, 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 and all of that. Uh, you know, Daryl and I talk about it constantly. COVID's not going to go away. It's going to be here forever. We'll, this will ebb and flow, and the next pandemic will take its place. And this is what we're all trying to do right now, is be better prepared for the next one so we don't have this mass hysteria that we had over the last 18 months. It's a great point. Really, really so, great point. Uh, Richard, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. Just uh, let me know when you want to come on. We'll have this out there uh, probably in the next few days so you can share it and like it out there, folks. Please uh, join us next time. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thanks for having me.